Okay. This is just silly. It's not the like the the title of the talk is this. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, will you explain what a moose is? Yes. Okay. <laughs> New animals for us. You know, we don't have them here. I know. I know. <laughs> okay, Olivier Bilodeau from uh, Canada. Is that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Represent. <laughs> you have the floor. So uh, I presented about IoT uh, in a local conference in Quebec uh, in French uh, called Hackfest. And so I had uh, one of uh, my colleagues from ESET, uh, Marc Etienne, did a nice uh, fake uh, Shutterstock photo for the, the, the talk, which I decided to share because it's featuring the cyber team and uh, has French in it, and also mentions shell shock photos instead of uh, Shutterstock photos anyway. So just... Uh, little aside here. So today I'm going to present about uh, Linux Moose, which is an embedded Linux botnet. Uh, the agenda will be embedded Linux malware. Uh, in general, just a little bit of the description. Uh, Moose DNA, so description of the malware, uh, the operation, uh, and then uh, a few updates, what's new regarding this botnet, and some takeaways. Throughout the presentation, it will be sprinkled with uh, lessons learned. Uh, of the of our uh, story, if you want, uh, looking and investigating this botnet, and also some design decisions that we will highlight of the uh, done by the malware operators, uh, good and bad. Also, some code snippet. Uh, we shared a lot of our code for this research on GitHub, uh, so we will uh, plug it. And um, so yeah, so before we dive into the subject. Uh, why am I here? So I'm a malware researcher at ESET. I now I switched jobs since then. I work for GoSecure now, which is uh, I, I, I starting a new research department in this small Canadian company. But all of this research was done as ESET and uh, is presented uh, as ESET. Um, I did some lectures at ETS in Montreal. Uh, also, I was uh, before involved a lot in Linux systems as an InfoSec developer, network administrator, uh, for core and internet networking at the Bell Canada ISP and uh, Linux sysadmin for Bell also. We, st we have a few things in uh, Montreal that which uh, are worth of mention if you ever come uh, by Montreal, which is Montreal, which are hands-on security workshops, so three hours of hands-on CTF solving uh, challenges. And also, uh, I uh, do the NordSec uh, Hacker Jeopardy every year, and I'm also in charge of the NordSec trainings so if any of one of you is a trainer and still has time and doesn't leave right after the conference, come and see me. I might be interested in having you do, give a training in Montreal. So uh, what is embedded Linux malware? What marketing or the internet as a whole likes to call internet of things malware? Well, basically, it's malware running on an embedded Linux system, right? No, nothing to learn here. So what kind of embedded Linux system? Mostly consumer routers, but some DVRs, some smart TVs, IP cameras, etc. A lot of stuff. What are the characteristics of embedded Linux systems? Well, there is not a lot of memory, not a lot of flash. Uh, rarely, there is a hard drive. Usually, it's not uh, on running on 80, x86 architectures, so ARM, MIPS, some PowerPC, Super H. Uh, there's a wide variety of libc implementations and version. Uh, you can have very, it's like almost never the GNU libc, which is there. Uh, it's always using a Linux kernel, um, so, well, because it's an embedded Linux uh, in this case, the specific case I'm covering today, uh, which is uh, very important is that the ABI is compatible. So syscalls are always compatible, which means that, as we'll see later, we uh, rely on this to do statically linked binaries, which uh, make reverse engineering a bit uh, more complex because there are a lot of code to look at. It supports ELF binaries. There is rarely a UI, and uh, it's networked. So attractive because there would be a lot of potential victims. Also, maybe what I should have added here is that security usually is an afterthought in these systems. It's not really designed with security in mind. So why uh, threats on these system matters? Well, as I mentioned, there is no UI, or uh, rarely a UI besides a web interface, which means that it's hard to detect, and also hard to remediate, how, how hard to have access to the system and do some like computer-type task, unless you uh, solder you know, pins and you get access with a serial connection on it. Uh, it's hard to fix problem also. 
Uh, vendor updates are non-existent or mostly inexistent. And um, right now, it's been a low-hanging fruit for bad guys. If you uh, put something listening on Telnet port on the internet, you will notice that there's a lot of things going on trying to attack uh, routers on Telnet port with default credentials and then uh, push binaries and uh, leverage the, your, your device. So it's real also. Several cases were disclosed in the last two years. A lot of the same stuff, so DDoS mostly, some Bitcoin mining, but they soon realized it was not efficient to do Bitcoin mining on consumer routers. Uh, and things are only getting worse. So just a few of the things we saw, if you've been watching this space for the last months, uh, Sality had a DNS uh, changer named Win32Rbrute, which uh, a colleague of mine, Benjamin, talked about, which is so related to the Sality. Um, malware that was the previous presentation. Other stuff found by Avast, so hiding with an embedded rootkit. Uh, also, the Lizard Squad group was found to use embedded malware to uh, do DDoS, so controlled by a panel, but still running on uh, which it's called Laser Stressor. Also, lately, there was a, for a virus bulletin, Simon Tech published about uh, YFATCH, which uh, was a vigilante worm that, of IoT, which was cleaning the other infections. And lately, uh, we saw that it could have future targets like the Hello Barbie, which has Wi-Fi and which has been proven to be insecure already. So no malware, I think, yet on this one, but it's definitely a future target. So we're ta we say IoT, but is this really about things right now? So no, the point I want to make here is not yet. IoT has been mostly collateral damage. So that's why the focus of this talk is embedded Linux, which is, I, I feel, more accurate description of where the malware is. Um, so what is affected? Again, you know, leveraging very uh, the network capabilities and the, the position and the weak security is uh, consumer routers or how I would prefer to present them by, based on their security, a ton of crap. <laughs> so I understand it's not that great. Security is not great. There's market pressure and everything. But still, things will have to change. And they started changing, which is good. Uh, but uh, the industry or, I don't know, something will still have to, uh, to uh, improve. For example, admin, admin as a password. Things will have to change because right now the, uh, there is a caffeine blogged about a CSERF uh, payload, which leveraged the so kind of defeating your firewall, going to your router from the inside, and then changing your configuration, your DNS configuration, which means that uh, if you can randomize the password for the WPA key, randomize the password for the admin, please. Stuff like that, you know. So what kind of malware can we find on such insecure devices? This is a list of the stuff I looked at while looking for a new version of Linux Moose. Uh, here you can see that Lizard Stressor is actually GAFGIT, which has been, uh, which is more or less clear if you read Krebs, uh, Krebs post, but is clear uh, when you look at the binary. But these are all mostly forks because they had access to source code, so they all copy each other and add their own thing in it. With this behind us, let's dive into the Linux Moose story. So first thing we learned uh, analyzing Linux Moose is the statically linked strip binaries. So statically linked means that the libraries are inlined into the binary. And strip means no debugging symbols, for those who are not familiar. So no imports means everything is inside. Um, and everything is bundled down to the kernel syscall. And the disassembler, even if you have one, so if, even if you have the, the big ass version of IDA with the ARM disassembler, it doesn't help you because there is just a ton of C code and nothing makes any sense beside the syscalls, which are hard coded and which IDA doesn't even map. Uh, you need to look at the .h file for the Linux kernel and then manually or through an IDA script uh, map them. So just to give you a sense, this, this is how. Uh, the Linux Moose binary looks in IDA. So this, as you can see, is we see in those three pages 33 uh, lines of functions out of 500 functions. So this is only the beginning of the, of the whole thing. Uh, now, the, the code is not simple to analyze. Let's take as an example if you try to debug the printf, just so you get a sense of how complicated it is to, do, uh, to deal with uh, statically linked strip binaries. 
So this is the uh, printf family of calls. In this, there is no syscall that are directly. Everything will go through the put syscall, which is re really deeper in the, in the thing. So this uh, small piece of the proximity graph of IDA is part of this larger, uh, as you can see, the, uh, the pattern in the middle. Uh, so this is still all um, printf, and not functions, but group of functions. And you can see the vprintf internal. So most of the external interfaces, snprintf, sprintf, are all calling at some point vprint, uh, underscore vf printf internal. This function, we have to go deeper to reach it, is like, uh, looks like this. So again, I want to stress that you, uh, this is all. There is no single syscall in this uh, code. So you, you're not sure if you are in malware code or if you are in, um, in library code at this point, unless you know your uh, printf implementation by the look of its graph. And so you have to look it up. The ecosystem makes, makes it even worse because uh, the libc are always changing. So uh, compiled binaries will change often. And the IDA flirt signatures for this type of architecture is, is uh, I, it never worked in, my, in all the samples I looked at. So it might, there might be some tricks I don't know, and I'm open to suggestions if there's any. Also, there are variable, uh, various uh, C libraries. So you have mu C libc, uh, aj libc, glibc, muzzle, and a lot of other C libraries, which, again, any binary which you have C code can be linked against. And so it would uh, have you start your analysis from scratch if it's a different C library. So the lesson that we learned uh, here is what we tried at first to map the syscall with an IDA script. But um, there was still too much uh, code to reverse engineer because as the example I just gave, going back through the put syscall up to the printf, we were still not sure in which uh, part of the code we were. Were we in malware code? Were we in a printf? It wasn't clear. So we still provide the tool just in case if anyone wants to use it. But uh, we found a better solution. So what we did is we reproduced the environment, so the architecture, libc and compiler version. We built libraries with symbol under the same condition. And then we used bin diff to map library functions. Uh, and then uh, we were able to focus on uh, malware code. So it sounds easier than it actually is. Uh, but maybe, um, maybe not. Maybe we, we find we think we're clever, but we were not. Uh, it's actually Mark Etienne's idea, another colleague at ESET. Um, and here's what it's, it looks like. So in this specific case of Linux Moose, we used uclibc 0.9.33, uh, 0 .9 which uh, we compiled using the OpenWRT toolchain. So this is probably what the malware author are using to compile the, the solution. Uh, uh, more than 225 functions were mapped with a, a high confidence and high similarity uh, rating. So we didn't even have to think about like, oh, should we import it or should we look at it? Like 225 were done, like select all and then just import. And so stuff like strn compare, fgets, uh, inet nettop, openzir were all straight imported into the, the Moose library. And so it really, really helped us uh, kickstart this investigation. So the lesson zero is going down to syscall is too long in large binaries. Uh, find a close match of, a C, of your C library, build it with symbols, and then bid and diff it. Or maybe we could have flirted at this point, which uh, is something I'm not familiar with. This is why we went with binzif since we had licenses and we were comfortable with it. Another lesson that we learned is be careful of strings and AV variant names. So in the specific Linux Moose case, the AV variant names were all, uh, if it may, might be a little bit small, so I'll spell it out. Uh, so uh, Bitcoin miner or Bitcoin miner related, ESET had uh, agent.p. Uh, but so when we first look at it, we were like, OK, so this is a miner thing. So we were really looking for. Bitcoin mining features in the, the, the binary, only to realize that it was killing Bitcoin miners uh, inside the, 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 the feature set of the, the, the malware. It was actually looking for processes of Bitcoin miners and killing them. And it was flagged as other AV as a Bitcoin miner because of those strings, which again is a misclassification. So everyone gets bad intel. We think it's a miner, but it's not actually. Another thing that happened is uh, we found a host name inside the strings. Uh, so uh, 
at some point, we were collaborating with external uh, entities on the, the research. And we, they told us after the fact that they requested a takedown on the getcool.com domain, which is in the strings that is here. And so I was like, first, this is not cool. You're, I share you a sample, and you go and take down a domain without asking, asking me first. Not cool. And which, like, the, it was funny because in the end, it turns out that this was completely un unrelated. It's a fixed uh, host header used by the malware. So the lesson, again, is you know, be careful with the strings that you see. And also, don't do uh, stuff or take down based on other people's research. Please get in touch first. So now going into the design of the malware. First thumbs up for the malware operators. Misleading strings. It creates confusion in the industry. Good job. Now if we look at the DNA malware description, uh, the gory details of this are all in the report that we released in May, uh, end of May. But uh, we'll summarize uh, some of it. So Linux Moose was discovered in November 2014. Thoroughly analyzed in early 2015, and we published a report, as I just said, in late May. And then after, I went to recon, and uh, it was BotConf CFP right after the recon hangover. So I was like, oh, cool, I never presented this nowhere. I need to write the CFP. That's why I'm here. Uh, so Linux Moose, just get this out of the way. Why Moose? Uh, well, it's named after a string, uh, Elan, present in the malware executable. Elan is uh, French for Moose. So Elan, which uh, I would say in uh, French. Elan, Elan. <laughs> so there's the French Canadian. French Canadian is Elan, a Elan in the French, French. <laughs> which is this animal. And so uh, I know you don't have uh, around here. I don't think there's many. Uh, so, but after we released the paper, some other people had better ideas for the Elan uh, string, <laughs> which was the Lotus Elan. So thanks to internet crowdsourcing. Or also there is a Slovak rock, rock band from the 70s, uh, late uh, 60s, called Elan. <laughs> Hat tip to Robert Lipovsky uh, for this less obvious reference for a Canadian. Uh, yeah, so, uh, but joking aside, the sample itself is a statically linked strip elf binary. Uh, the, we found ARM, uh, the two, two variants of uh, targeting two a, uh, ABIs, and uh, MIPS in both little and big engine variants. Uh, we found absolutely nothing, no x86 sample. Uh, so no uh, x-rays uh, for us. And the CNC IP was an integer uh, form buried in the code. So no, no strings to reveal the CNC IP like most of the Lizard Squad stuff uh, ha still has. So thumbs up. MIPS arm, statically linked, strip, no x86. Good job. It took it a long time. Bad job. The strings were not obfuscated. You can do better next time. So on a more serious note, what are the, the network capabilities? Uh, it can pivot through firewall. So uh, it's uh, infecting routers. So the, the routers are besides the network. And it, will, uh, it has a stun uh, type NAT traversal capability. So if you have a ten telnet listening host, it could, uh, even if you are firewalled like DMZ style with like n no outbound access, it could uh, uh, Use rendezvous uh, of itself if you want, like kind of peer to peer, to uh, get deeper into your network. Stuff that we didn't see really in use when we did the analysis, but it's it's possible by the by the design. There's also a custom made proxy service. This is the main payload that is used by the the, the criminals, uh, and it's the the proxy service is only available to a set of authorized IP addresses, which are decided by the CNC. So there's no way to fingerprint the, the internet uh, because of this list of authorized IP. Any connection that is not in that list will simply get a closed port. And if you scan on a, it's uh, by the way listening on a specific port, which is 10,073. Uh, so if you scan the internet on this port and you see any firewall which do a close, it, it will be, have the same behavior as this proxy if you're not authorized. So there was no way for us to map uh, population of the botnet using that feature. 
It also has a remotely configured generic sniffer, so it can sniff uh, traffic, and it's the strings that it's interested in are provided by the co command and control server, and it has uh, DNS hijacking features. So lesson learned number two, don't assume it's custom when it can be a standard protocol. So I spent a lot of time looking at this, reversing it, and, um, and uh, uh, like writing in the report in, in big details uh, what was the proxy, how it was supported. I was interested by it because it supported both SOX 4 and 5 and HTTP, HTTPS at the same time. But the SOX part was all documented by hand, like, oh, the first byte is this, after there is the IP, after there is the port. And then when we en uh, entered the peer review stage of the, of the report, uh, a colleague of mine told me, oh, you know what you thoroughly described is actually a SOX proxy, just normal SOX. So <laughs> don't. I spent all this time writing all that description of SOX where I could, so a lot of delete afterwards, delete two, three pages, and just, it sucks v4 and v5. <laughs> so thumbs up for the design of having authorized IPs only. As I said, we couldn't fingerprint scan the internet because of that. We tried some things with the Rapid7 folks, like if Telnet is present and the port is a shut and not a stealth, but it didn't work. Like we had crazy amounts of uh, hosts. So uh, good job. Bad job, CNC IP is hard-coded, no fallback domain or no DGA. We, I know how much we all love DGAs now. <laughs> and it, it was not there, so yeah, surprising. So another thing that uh, the Linux Moose does is the trying to spread itself uh, through a worm-like behavior. So this is a kind of a, a rough map of everything it will try to scan. So it will try to scan internet at, at large, but it will dedicate a, a lot of th threads to scan the closely related IP addresses. So not um, wide internet, but really close. And we assume that this is uh, in order to find mistakes in firewall configuration. Who, will allow, who would block you know, a lot of the IPs, but if it's inside or nearby, in ISPs, for example, then it would be allowed. And in our uh, monitoring, um, we uh, let the Telnet uh, brute forcer run for uh, a few days. And we noticed the success rate of the completely random scan versus the uh, close by IPs. And we noticed that it, it is effective. It is something that seems to be uh, bypassing some firewall rules. And again, uh, another thread per each LAN interface where it will uh, linearly scan for Telnet um, all, uh, all of the, 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 the subnet. Attack vector is a Telnet credential brute force using a word list of 300, uh, 304 user and password entries, which are provided by the CNC. Uh, we monitored the um, CNC for uh, a few months, and the, the word list never changed. And it was easy to find it on the internet, so they used the list online. Here's uh, roughly the compromise protocol. So what is really intriguing is that the CNC is actively involved during the compromise. Uh, which is, uh, again, uh, you know, a design decision that uh, we'll discuss. But uh, so what happens is vic victim information is sent to the CNC server, and then the CNC sends obfuscated commands with like uh, Bozo crypto. Uh, the, the, the router performing the infection will unscrabble them and then send the commands directly uh, to the victim via Telnet. Two uh, different mechanisms uh, to deliver the payload. One was a wget on the, the, the end, the router which means you can do replay attack and then obtain the binary. But the other one was using echo with X uh, escape character. So, so sending through the, the middle router a lot of echo, 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 and append on the file up until when the file would be complete on the victim and then uh, uh, enabling execution and executing it, which is nice because there's no replay attack. If, you're not, if you don't have full packet capture, you cannot uh, extract the binary. So good design, you, it can perform cross-arch infection, meaning a MIPS sample can compromise an ARM router and still deliver the right binary. But if the CNC is down, there's no more infection. So CNC is really, again, a key weakness in this design. And something weird, there's no persistent, persistence. Sorry. Uh, it's probably hard to do in a portable fashion. This is something I was told after the virus bulletin where I gave a small talk on Linux Moose. 
Uh, it's true, uh, the, the flash uh, memory and stuff like that probably makes it complicated. And it's probably the reason why it's not done. And also, they can always come back. They got in through weak credentials, and it was available from the internet. It means that they can come back. And another good design of Linux moves, it literally kills the competition. So it will look for but, uh, Bitcoin miners, DDoS, anything that will fight for resources uh, on the malware side, and it will try to kill uh, all of these uh, processes every hour. So in a nutshell, this is how it's the, the, the thing is laid out in, on the, purely from our analysis of the sample. Uh, so propagation, proxy server, uh, NAT traversal, and also the generic sniffer that eavesdrop on the network. Lessons learned number three, less reverse engineering, more honeypot. Because we were stuck. We, uh, we had all this understanding, but we still didn't know what was going on with the threat, what was the goal. So we deployed the QMU VM in the cloud. So uh, uh, Debian MIPS QMU image, have it reachable from the internet. Before it, it was reachable from the internet, we had nothing. When it, once it became reachable, uh, things really started uh, moving. So we watched it behave and we firewalled it to avoid infecting other people with our, our uh, things. So if you want some hints, the RL images are already pre-done, pre-packaged. And here's a QMU command, uh, which is the, a nice way to use uh, and uh, easy to deploy in the cloud. So you can copy that once the slide will be available. So the lesson that we've learned here was we were too careful. I like coded a fake server and had like everything done in isolated environment. And at the end, in the end, we went YOLO and uh, we gathered a lot of information and it really helped the, ana the analysis. So thumbs up, it was a hard to track malware. Uh, we had a hard time reproducing the environment necessary to be able to understand the operation. So moose herding. So it has uh, potential for espionage because of the packet sniffer. It has infiltration capabilities because of NAT traversal and, um, and uh, spreading past firewalls. What are they using it for? Fortunately, well, the first thing we realized it is it was sniffing uh, cookies for uh, social media sites, which we had preferred more APT type, you know, the first Linux APT, stuff like that would have been nice, but no, social media. And we were like, what? Sniffing HTTPS cookies? Hmm. Because all of these cookies are now all on HTTPS only. So for us, it was, again, a, a weird thing, you know. Then we started looking at the proxy usage. So the, the 10.0.0.73 port that is used. We, uh, in the next few slides, we will look at the nature of the traffic, the protocol, the targeted uh, social networks. Uh, here in blue, uh, the higher line is the number of requests uh, per day done on the proxy of our Anipot. And uh, in blue is social uh, media network related traffic. In uh, the light blue is other, so there's none, it's all zeros. And it, in uh, the orange, it's uh, botnet traffic. So a little bit of meta traffic, but most of it was social networks. So even throughout the months that we monitored this threat, we didn't see the operator using it as a VPN. We didn't see any uh, things like that. It was really only doing performing uh, requests on several social uh, networks. So if, uh, if we look at the rundown of the protocol, 4% of operator HTTP, 18% of social network, uh, but uh, access through HTTP, all of it was Instagram. All of the other social network were all HTTPS. And the HTTPS allowed us to look at the certificate. Because due to the nature of the SOX proxy, we would only see the IP addresses. And IP addresses nowadays always, or most always, resolve to cloud addresses. So you reach AWS, you're not sure who was the original intention. You know, was it Instagram? Was it Twitter? Was it another? Or uh, also a lot of CDNs in that traffic. And so uh, HTTPS enabled us, because of the certificate and the CN in the certificate, to understand what social networks were targeted. And here's a rundown of the HTTPS traffic. So the, on the, the right-hand side, you see an extrapolation of the 3% of others. So don't get fooled by that. There's a very little index. It's not a big, big uh, part. Uh, but 
the, so the biggest social network targeted was Twitter or, uh, and Vine, which they use, the, the C names are like c colliding. Um, Instagram, uh, second, and then others like YouTube, Yandex, Yahoo, and uh, uh, quite a lot of SoundCloud also. So yes, a lot of HTTPS, but we digged into the HTTP that we saw. Uh, this is uh, the, the only HTTP traffic that was available was, as you can see uh, in number two, an upgrade to HTTPS. So the, the only thing we had was the, the location of the first hit, the first get, if you want, in number one. Uh, and this is how we based uh, our, uh, the, the following slides of what we think it's doing. So as an example, we looked at one of the user that was fetched, and we tracked it through time. So the, the pattern was they are created, and then a few hours later, there, there is around uh, always below 50 that the accounts that was newly created follows. And then we looked at uh, what they are following, and we noticed that they follow each other, so a lot of cross-referencing. And uh, once in a while, they will follow some accounts which looks more like either business or models. There were a lot of, of traffic around modeling. Um, and so in this case, uh, Signé seems to be a kind of a wedding type business. So we looked at it when we first saw it. It was three, they had 3,000 followers and uh, only seven posts and following seven people. And they have no internet presence beside their Instagram. So it's not, a, you know, oh, we have a big business and we, we launch something on Instagram on the side. It's more the other way around. Instagram seemed to be their main operation. Uh, and then one week after, so we went from 3,000 uh, following follower to 11,600, adding a few pictures and following one new account, and still no big internet presence. So for us, it was enough evidence to, without, like, we did the best we could, but enough evidence to, um, to assess that it's probably a botnet that is used to do social media follows, like views, and stuff like that. So fraud hidden in HTTPS, good job, because uh, this really make our job of assessing impact and convincing people it's important harder. The proof is not as strong as it could be. Except Instagram first hit. Sorry, guy, you forgot this one. So in a nutshell, what we have in the operation is stolen cookies, social uh, network fraud, and focus on reproduction spreading. Uh, these are the operations done by the, the thing. And you know, in here, the victim, the guy besides the, the router, is not really a real victim. And this is why the, the, the botnet might not be as interesting for, uh, as a takedown or whatever. The, as soon as you reboot your router, it's clean, right? Because there's no persistent mechanism. So what happens when your internet goes bad or you don't understand? And for example, what will happen in this case is uh, the, the router will run out of memory because they spawn 35 threads and they do all this kind of stuff. Memory management is minimal. So, uh, so what will happen is you will start having problems with your internet, you reboot your router, you're cleaned, and now you can, you can you know, move on. So no one, it's really designed to stay under the radar, it feels. So latest developments. The impact of our white paper, uh, af a few weeks after the publication, the CNC went dark. Um, uh, I was in contact of the hosting uh, provider, and I was trying to uh, help to try to have access to the, the, the IPs. I, wa I really wanted the IPs to assess the botnet size and the impact. And uh, I, I, he told me, oh, it's compromised, it's compromised, it's not uh, malicious, I'm sure. I said, OK, cool. Can I help clean it? You know, I will do it for free. And uh, you know, I will rent you a server. We will move on the side the, um, the, 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 the infected guy. And I will install, I will you know, take care of the, I will rent a server, install the old IPs in it, and then just you know, gather the traffic. But uh, it didn't happen. I stopped hearing uh, from him until we published. And then when we published, he came back, oh, sorry, I was on vacation for a long time. Uh, I missed, uh, I forgot to reply to your email. And then we were again close to have some kind of arrangement. And again, he went completely dark. And at the same time, uh, this is INC, uh, uh, ISC, uh, Internet Storm Center uh, port probe of the internet. So this doesn't mean much, you know, but it's still uh, probes that they have deployed everywhere on the internet that can roughly tell you the, the volume of traffic that they saw. And 
this is beyond, you know, uh, internet noise because internet noise looks like this, you know, the, the July to September uh, part of the chart. And so what happens is that the few weeks I was in contact afterwards and then at some point they probably for real cleaned the machine or and or removed them. But unfortunately, I couldn't get access to the IP addresses. So again, no, no measure of impact. So this is activity on the port 10073. So afterwards, I was on the lookout for Moose version 2. So I, I knew or I expected that they read the paper. And uh, I knew that they would, uh, you know, um, some of the stuff that we said, they would try to avoid it. So that, that my Yara rules, my hunting rules must, must be like trying to, to, you know, plan ahead, to beat the, the guys, be cleverer than them. Uh, but I still looked at a ton of samples because I, I expected them to UPX the whole thing just and so defeat the, the Yara rules, but uh, still, you know, have it like stay the same. Uh, and at some point we found an update right before uh, Virus Bulletin. Um, uh, it's, it's using a new service port as, as was expected since it was highlighted like this in the, the report. Uh, they added a CNC selection on the, the CLI. So the CNC server is no more in the binary. It's when the malware is launched and since it has CNC co cooperation, as we saw in the compromised slide, uh, it will be able, it, it's packed as an integer and it's slightly obfuscated, so XORed in the code, and uh, it will use this new CNC. Another thing they did is the server returns a 404 on unknown hosts. So I was able to get a, a sample. I was able to get uh, the integer that was used to, to launch the sample, but I tried recreating the, an environment from a different IP and the CNC just never responded to the request of my new, uh, my, my new uh, fake uh, client, if you want. So we're still trying to get infected at this point. Now I have like open honeypots trying, uh, I, with uh, some passwords that I know were in the list, trying to be infected um, by this threat again. And the goal is to this time do man in the middle uh, of the SSL traffic and try to see if, if the bot will still um, will still uh, connect. So reading research paper and adapting, thumbs up, malware operator. If we look at the traffic uh, of, the, um, of the new version, you can see that they had the, uh, kind of a, a vacation for the summer. And then they, they kick-started in September the new version. So this is the, the port analysis, the previous botnet, and the new port of the new, uh, the new version. Some takeaways. Uh, we released some uh, research artifacts, so Python and shell script, uh, protocol dissectors, the fake server code I've written. Uh, a lot of it is T Shark wrappers and uh, Yara rule and IOCs. Everything is in uh, the uh, ESETS GitHub. Uh, I know it's not of a uh, huge value, but um, anyone like looking to do a net, more network type uh, analysis and research, uh, I think the T-Shark stuff is pretty uh, decent. And I'm, I'm more of a network background and really familiar with these things, so it might be uh, some inspiration. And you know, if not for professional, at least for someone who is trying to get started. Um, uh, another takeaway is the embedded uh, Linux malware is not yet complex. Uh, but still, the tools and the processes need to catch up. Uh, the Windows stuff is definitely uh, more complex, advanced, and hard to track. But uh, we have absolutely no visibility. And without you know, visibility, we have a problem uh, saying the impact or the number of infected hosts, which makes it really harder to have a good, a good case uh, and help convince people of the importance of the threat. It is still a low-hanging fruit. And uh, prevention is really simple. Uh, like right now, what I started doing is every time I get into a new network, I look the web administration interface of the router I, I, am, uh, I am connecting to. And if I can get in, but, uh, of course, I do this at friends' home. I don't do this in public settings. But if I can get in with an admin admin, then I change the password, take a post-it, write down the new password I chose for them, and put the post-it on the router itself. The threats are doing this from the network, from outside. If you have physical access anyway, you're screwed. So I think this is a, just a good mean to raise the security and the awareness of people around you. So yeah, I would say, like, friends don't let friends run routers with default credentials. 
Any questions? Oops. Any questions? So questions if you want to see the underwear again? Yeah. Sponsors are more important. Okay. <laughs> Really, no question? Wow. <laughs> no, ah, over there. Power is back on, on, on the right side. Um, I was just thinking, like, would you suggest that maybe people should have some kind of AV running on the router to prevent this in the future, or at least, you know, detect it earlier? So, uh, uh, is it uh, F-Secure or uh, who released the new uh, kind of router who will do uh, F-Secure? So, there's a new device, you know, who will do uh, Sophos or F-Secure? F-Secure Sense. F -Secure Sense. Yeah. So, you see that some uh, people in the market are trying to address this problem. Another thing that uh, ESET is, uh, is working on, and I know Avast also presented about it at VB, is uh, from the... Um, uh, from your host, your AV is trying to connect on your router and verifies if it's vulnerable and suggest sends you pop-ups and suggests you to patch it. There are legal, you know, potential pitfalls, but I guess if you're uh, already choosing correctly between home network, business network, and, you know, public network, and the AV uses that information to know, okay, it's home, I can scan and warn you that you have default credentials. I think these are, like, of course, it shouldn't have come to this like this bad, but I think it's a fair uh, solution. But running security solution on routers, I don't think is realistic. Uh, hi, my my question goes to the uh, to the development environment type of thing. So you said you had a bit of a hard time to reproduce this development environment. Do you think there's a lot of variability in this development environment and? Second sub question, so to speak, is have you have you checked if there's like artifacts between the first and and the second second version of that threat that you've seen, uh, which make you like infer their uh, development uh, environment, things like GCC versions or something like that. So for the the first version, we saw uh, we I'm pretty sure that they're running the OpenWRT toolchain which makes it pretty, you know, reproducible and easy to, um, to build the, sam the, not the samples, but the, the right libraries and everything. For version 2, I haven't looked too closely at it because we can still bin zip from the previous version to the new version. There's a lot of noise, more noise, but still we're, we're not, we don't want to do as, uh, an as thorough job as we did on the first uh, time around. Um, so I haven't looked at it deeply enough, but in a general sense, since uh, all of the embedded samples I looked at, of course, it's crazy the degree of variability. You know, there are, uh, I don't know, at least 10 projects who are bootstrapping uh, embedded uh, code initiative. Some target really low memory environments, some target bigger environments. And like uh, the vendors are also have all their own um, SDKs. So if you want to target specifically TP-Link or Belkin, you can. Uh, so it's, uh, the, it would be nice to have some kind of a, a project who would try to uh, map these things and uh, do something about it. Definitely, uh, it would be worthwhile, I think. Thanks. Last minute question. Okay, thank you. Ah, merci beaucoup.